Good morning and welcome to the Dollarama Fiscal 2023 Fourth Quarter Results Full Year Results Conference Call. Neil Rossi, President and CEO of NGP Towner CFO, will make a short presentation followed by a question and answer period open exclusively to financial analysts. The press release, financial statements, and management discussion and analysis are available at dollarama.com in the Investor Relations section, as well as on CDAR. Before we start, I have been asked by Dollarama to read the following message regarding forward-looking statements. Dollarama's remarks today may contain forward-looking statements about its current and future plans, expectations, intentions, results, levels of activity, performance, goals or achievements, or any other future events or developments. Forward-looking statements are based on information currently available to management and on estimates and assumptions made based on factors that management believes are appropriate and reasonable in the circumstances. However, there can be no assurance that such estimates and assumptions will be proved to be correct. Many factors could cause actual results, levels of activity, performance, achievements, future events, or developments to differ materially from those expressed or implied by the forward-looking statements. As a result, Dollarama cannot guarantee that any forward-looking statement will materialize, and you are cautioned to not place undue reliance on these forward-looking statements. For additional information on the assumptions and risks, please consult the cautionary statements regarding forward-looking information contained in Dollarama's MDNA, dated March 29, 2023, available on CDAR. Forward-looking statements represents management's expectation as at March 29, 2023, and except as may be required by law, Dollarama has no intention, undertakes no obligation to update or revise any forward-looking statement, whether as a result of new information, future events, or otherwise. I would now like to turn the conference call over to Neil Rossi. Thank you. Thank you, Operator, and good morning, everyone. This morning, Dollarama released outstanding full-year fiscal 2023 results meeting or exceeding annual guidance across all key metrics. We capped off the year on a particularly high note, delivering exceptional performance in the fourth quarter. Our strong operational and financial results reflect the continued positive consumer response to our year-round value proposition, which has only been reinforced in the context of high inflation. Our resilient and flexible business model enabled us to deliver from a procurement, operational, and cost management perspective while navigating a dynamic environment. That dynamic environment included lingering supply chain dislocations, which had to be carefully managed. Through fiscal 2023, we were very proactive in rebuilding our inventory to pre-pandemic levels and in circumventing some of the delays in the system impacting all retailers, all while mitigating the impacts of rising freight and logistics costs. Working through this was no easy feat, and I'm proud of the flexibility and capacity demonstrated by our procurement and logistics operations as we accomplished what we set out to do. We kept the goods flowing to our stores throughout the year, including for key seasons, and we successfully brought our inventory and in-stock positions back to acceptable levels by year-end. Our inventory position has also grown in tandem with our continued store network growth. Strong same-store sales performance and the introduction of higher price points. Fiscal 2023 marked the gradual rollout of new price points up to $5 beginning last summer, more than six years after our $4 price point introduction. To date, this new retail offering has been very well received by customers coast to coast. It has enabled us to offer new compelling SKUs. It has allowed us to bring back SKUs that were appreciated in the past but discontinued because of prohibitive costs. In addition, it has enabled us to continue offering several SKUs despite rising costs. We will continue to provide a wide array of compelling products at each of our price points ranging from $1 or less up to $5, and to refresh our products throughout the year as we always have. We remain extremely disciplined in our pricing strategy across all price points, item by item, to preserve our year-round relative value. 
Turning now to our Canadian footprint, we opened 65 net new stores in fiscal 2023, consistent with the prior six years, bringing our dollar AMA store count to 1,486 stores as at January 29, 2023. Going into fiscal 2024, we have a solid real estate pipeline with site opportunities across the country. Near term, we are looking forward to the opening of our 1500th net new store, making a significant milestone along our roadmap to reaching our long-term target of 2,000 stores in Canada by 2031. From a logistics perspective and in support of our long-term Canadian growth plans, we commissioned our seventh warehouse just before fiscal year end. At approximately 500,000 square feet and located near our existing logistics operations, the Laval facility significantly increases our warehousing capacity. Finally, as discussed on our last earnings call, we intend to purchase strategically located industrial properties adjacent to our distribution center in TMR, providing us with additional flexibility to support our long-term logistics needs. That transaction is expected to close in the second quarter of fiscal 2024. On the technology front, we continue to deploy capital towards transformational IT projects to the benefit of the business. One notable example this year has been the digitization and centralization of our recruitment platform for our store operations, which we believe will increase our efficiency and recruitment efforts as we continue to open new stores across Canada and keep our stores staffed in a tight labour market. I am also pleased with our progress on the ESG front throughout the year, including the publication of our climate strategy last June. This included our first generation climate goal of a 25% GHG intensity reduction for scope 1 and 2 emissions by 2030. This represents the first major step in our climate roadmap in the last year. We have already made very good progress towards achieving this goal, which we are tracking closely. We look forward to providing our next annual ESG update in just a few months. Turning to Latin America, Dollar City continues to perform well, meeting or exceeding our expectations in key performance metrics. Like Dollarama, the Dollar City value proposition resonates with consumers in their LATAM markets, resulting in strong store sales growth and store opening cadence. With the opening of 90 net new stores in calendar 2022, their total store count is now 440. Dollar City is making excellent progress towards its recently revised long-term store target of 850 stores by 2029 in its four current markets of operation. In conclusion, our outstanding performance in fiscal 2023 only reinforces the relevance of our value retail concept for consumers, the enduring strength of our unique business model, and our disciplined execution. This is true for Dollarama in Canada and Dollar City in Latin America. I would like to recognize and thank every Dollarama team member from our stores to our logistics operations and head office for their continued commitment to providing consumers with convenience and the best relative value on every dollar they spend in our stores. In the context of continued macroeconomic uncertainty and inflationary pressures on consumers, our priority is to remain and maintain our value promised to Canadians from all walks of life in fiscal 2024. Our, con our customers can continue to count on us. JP, over to you to review our financial results in more detail. Thank you, Neil, and good morning, everyone. Let's start with a quick overview of our exceptional fourth quarter results. Sales in Q4 grew 20.3%, reaching nearly $1.5 billion. Same-store sales grew 15.9%, supported by a double-digit increase in transaction volumes. Our strong top-line performance was driven by a number of factors, including the absence of pandemic-related restrictions, the introduction of higher price points, and the successful product refreshes across our offering. While the trade down by consumers, which accelerated throughout fiscal 2023, certainly boosted our consumable sales, 
our overall category mix remained quite stable and generally in line with the circle patterns. To illustrate, based on retail sales, consumables represented 42% of our mix in fiscal 2022 and 44% of our mix in fiscal 23. General merchandise and seasonal together continue to represent the majority of our total sales mix to product categories which have long made Dollarama a shopping destination. Gross margin was 44.6% of sales compared to 45.2% in Q4 22. The anticipated decrease reflects a slight change in the sales mix as described above and higher logistics costs related to our inventory rebuild. SGNA improved to 14.2% of sales compared to 14.5% the same quarter last year. This improvement primarily reflects the absence of COVID-19 related costs. EBITDA increased by 18.8% and diluted EPS increased by 23%. Two 91 cents for the fourth quarter of fiscal 2023. At year end, inventory stood at 957 million. With a stabilized inventory position from Q3 to Q4, the vast majority of our inventory rebuild is now behind us. A few comments on full year results and the financial metrics guidance we achieved before turning to the outlook for fiscal 24. We delivered an outstanding sales performance throughout the year, delivering on our value proposition, which resonated more than ever in a high inflation environment. This translated into SSS growth of 12% for the full fiscal year, exceeding our expectations of 95 to 10.5%. We maintain industry-leading gross margins of 43.5% of sales compared to 43.9% in the prior year, in line with guidance provided. SGNA came in at 14.3% of sales compared to 15.1% for fiscal 22, an improvement primarily driven by minimal COVID-19 costs and the positive scaling impact of strong sales, also in line with our guidance. On the back of an acceleration in same-store sales, active gross margin management, and a higher equity pickup from Dollar City, we delivered strong earnings growth with diluted EPS up 27% to $2.76. Turning now to capital allocation, we remained active throughout the year on the NCIB front. In total, we repurchased 8.9 million shares for total cash consideration of 689 million during fiscal 23. A cash dividend was also declared each quarter, and today the board approved a 28% increase of the quarterly cash dividend to 7.08 cents per share. CapEx came in at 157 million, primarily due to the timing of the delivery of the racking of our new Laval warehouse, which will now fall under fiscal 2024 CapEx. In fiscal 2024, we will maintain a balanced approach to capital allocation by continuing to invest in organic growth and return capital to shareholders. We intend to maintain our pace of net new store openings with the target of 60 to 70 net new stores for fiscal 24, in addition to continued investments in maintenance and transformational capital projects. As such, we expect to deploy between 190 and 200 million in CapEx in fiscal 24. The year-over-year increase primarily reflects the remaining investments in our Laval warehouse. This CapEx budget excludes the $87 million property acquisition agreement anticipated to close by the second quarter. In addition to maintaining a dividend subject to quarterly approval, we intend to allocate our excess free cash flows toward the repurchase of shares through our NCIB. We continue to believe that this represents an appropriate and efficient use of excess cash to increase shareholder value. In the current macroeconomic environment, we will continue to actively manage our capital structure and anticipate that our leverage ratio will be below our historical target range of 2.75 to three times throughout fiscal 24. Specifically, in the current interest rate environment, our after-tax cost of debt compared to our earnings yield is not generating meaningful accretion. 
at your end are adjusting that debt to EBITDA ratio was 2.71 times. Turning to our financial performance guidance for fiscal 2024, on SSS, we expect that the first half of fiscal 24, we will continue to benefit from strong demand for affordable everyday items in the context of continued inflationary pressures on consumers. Looking at our SSS performance in the first quarter of fiscal 24, two months in, we are pacing at the same two-year SSS average as in Q4 of fiscal 23. However, these demand trends are expected to normalize through the second half of the fiscal year. As a result, our SSS growth expectation for fiscal 24 is in the range of 5 to 6%. While we anticipate higher demand for lower margin consumable products, to carry over into fiscal 24, lower freight costs and logistics costs on imported goods are expected to positively impact gross margins. We've definitely seen a stabilization in global supply chains of late and believe we are in the final stages of its normalization. As such, and based on our current visibility, we expect gross margin as a percentage of sales to improve year over year and to be in the range of 43.5 to 44.5 percent of sales. Wage pressures on SGNA will be more substantial in fiscal 24 compared to the prior year, partially offset by the positive impact of scaling as well as ongoing efficiency initiatives. Accordingly, SGNA guidance for the full year is in the range of 14.7 percent to 15.2 percent of sales. Rotating challenges seem to have been the hallmark of the past few years. Our ability to consistently deliver through the pandemic, persistent supply chain issues, increasing economic and geopolitical instability, and rapid inflation speaks to the relevance of our value promise and the resilience of our business model. These factors position us well for continued growth despite the uncertain economic context. That concludes our formal remarks, and I'll turn it over to the operator for the Q&A. Thank you. We will now take questions from the telephone lines. If you have a question and you're using a speakerphone, please lift your headset before making your selection. If you have a question, please press star 1 on your device's keypad. You may cancel your question at any time by pressing star 2. Please press star 1 at this time if you have a question. There will be a brief pause while the participants register for questions. Thank you for your patience. Our first question is from Irene Natal with RBC Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Thanks and good morning, everyone. Uh, great end to the year. Uh, wondering if we could start, please, with um, what you're seeing in terms of consumer demand, demand for both, you know, both consumables and GM seasonal, and what the consumer response has been in particular to the higher price points. Morning, Irene. Um, it's it's been pretty even across most categories. Uh, slight uh, strength, I guess, or strengthening of our consumables more than the non-consumable category. But really, we've seen a, an increase across all categories, and uh, the same for seasonal. And price points, Neil? Price points also very well accepted and aligned with existing price points. So I think the gradual execution of, um, of the same relative value has been well accepted by our customers. That's great. Thank you. And a couple of points of qualification, if I might, just around uh, elements of the uh, F24 guidance. In particular, um, the, the SGNA, quite an interesting step up. What factors are at play there and kind of what causes things to end up at one end or the other? And then on the NCIB, um, how should we be thinking about magnitude of NCIB and funding of NCIB in uh, F24? Thank you. Okay, thanks, Irene. Uh, on SGNA, I, I think the first important point is to note that 
we're still facing uh, an extremely tight labor market and I mean, we see unemployment rates where they are and they're still fairly, fairly low levels. In the second half of fiscal 23, we've seen an acceleration in wage pressure. We talked about it on the last earnings call. Um, and we expect that trend to continue in fiscal 2024. 20, um, I think we'll be able to offset a portion of that through revenue scaling and efficiency initiatives but there's, there's going to be a remaining impact to the bottom line. And what's also important to note, in addition to wages, uh, is that we're seeing increased traffic in our stores, which means uh, more, t- more hours spent on replenishing our inventory, replenishing our shelves. We're also in the last innings of our inventory rebuild, which means the goods are making their way from our DC to the stores, which also requires more labor hours. But the vast majority of the SGNA increase um, is driven by the wage environment. Thanks, JP. And the NCIB? On the NCIB, the first important comment is that we intend to remain very active on our NCIB program. When we talk in uh, the press release and in my comments about the leveraging, it's important to to note that that's not occurring as a result of our intent to pay down debt, but simply as a result of EBITDA growth, which will naturally bring our leverage down over the next few quarters. And when I say our leverage down, I mean modestly down. I don't expect our leverage to be in a completely different zip code. So we intend to remain very active on the buyback. That's great. Thank you. Thanks, Harry. Thank you. Our next question is from Brian Morrison with TD Securities. Please go ahead. Oh, thank you. Um, on the NCAB, can I just clarify that? That's, so you're simply going to finance through your surplus free cash flow. We should not expect any additional leverage to facilitate, correct? That's correct. Thank you. I guess maybe for Neil, when I think about inflation starting to decline and possibly a a bit of a mixed shift away from consumables, it's clearly driving traffic right now. Is there a risk of seeding some of the market share you're gaining or what steps or are there any steps you can take that you can take to ensure those gains are maintained? I think the best way to ensure it is to make sure that the customers that we're gaining, if we are in fact gaining customers, are satisfied that the lower prices that they're paying for their goods are for goods that are equally good or better. And so as long as we continue to source and and procure goods that satisfy our customers' level of of quality control and and assortment, uh, and we remain, you know, the best everyday value, we will likely keep many of those customers. But the risk is always there, of course, that you know, when they're in another store, when times are slightly less challenging, that they'll simply pay more. Uh, so we can only do so much, but I think the goal is to satisfy that, them in the, in the sense that if they've come and they're new and they buy and they're satisfied and they've paid less, hopefully they'll be happy to pay less for it. <laughs> okay. Last question, um, JP. Dollar City, new store growth should have been above the 8% equity income growth that you realized in Q4. Maybe just some details on the performance, be it sales or gross margin performance. What took place there? I would have expected it to be a slight bit higher. Yeah, so Q4 uh, Dollar City, we saw excellent top line performance. Uh, The challenge was the inventory rebuild like we had to go through in the second half of last year. So they, they've faced some of those temporary challenges, uh, but a good portion of that is behind them and uh, behind us. So I, I think you can assume that if it weren't for those challenges, you would have seen a higher net income pickup uh, in Q4. And that's behind us now? For the vast majority. Okay, great call. Thanks very much. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. 
Our next question is from George Dumay with Scotiabank. Please go ahead. Yeah, good morning, Neil and JP. Congrats on, on a good quarter. Um, for me, it's just a two-part question on the gross margins. Um, how much of the 60 basis point compression was mixed versus higher logistics costs in this quarter? And maybe looking ahead to the fiscal 24 guidance, uh, is it more of a second half story? And, and there's a pretty large range um, in the guide. Maybe what factor is determined if we fall in the lower end or, or in the upper end of that range? Thanks. So when you look at the Q4 uh, gross margin compression, uh, it, it's a mix of logistics and, and, and mix, and I'd say it's around 50-50. Uh, when you look at fiscal 24 and you think about our guidance range, the, the, the big driver, of course, is number one, the mix. Um, keep in mind that last year in the second half, we had uh, the trade down happening, so we had the mix shift. And then uh, in the first half of this year, assuming the trade down continues, uh, there could be an impact on the mix. On the flip side, uh, we entered into new ocean freight contracts uh, at the end of Q4, which are in effect, and that will uh, impact us positively throughout the year. So um, those are probably the two biggest drivers, the full year improvement in ocean freight costs and the mixed story, which is uh, a first half, second half story. Thanks for that. And on the same sort of sales guidance of 5 to 6 percent, uh, what are you guys thinking in terms of transaction count versus transaction size for the year? It's very, very hard to, to tell. Uh, we've seen good traffic uh, pick up on the, good, on, the, on the back of the trade down and market share gains. Um, as I said on the gross margin comment, a lot of that was weighted and skewed towards the second half. So there's probability that uh, it's more first half thing than a second half thing, but jury's out and we'll see how the year evolves. Okay, thanks. And just one last one, if I may, on, on the step up in CapEx for, for fiscal 24, should we think of that as uh, a level to build off of uh, going, going forward or is that maybe, can that come tick down a little bit? And maybe for JP, um, how should we think of working capital release, uh, if at all, for, for fiscal 24? Yeah, so on the, on the CapEx, the envelope for last year, so fiscal 23, was 160 to 170. We landed at 157. Um, that's really the baseline. In fiscal 24, we have some additional CapEx in there for the racking of our Laval warehouse and all the finishes that will need to be made there. Uh, but the baseline is really fiscal 23 levels. Um, and then when you think about working capital, um, you saw in, from Q3 to Q4, we had a positive working capital influx from our inventory position that's now stabilized. Um, as we said in our remarks, a lot of the supply chain pressures are now behind us. Uh, that being said, anything could happen, but from what we're seeing right now, uh, we're seeing a more stabilized supply chain, and therefore, if inventory stabilizes, you shouldn't see the same type of working capital pressures as you said in fiscal 23. Great. Thanks for your answers. I'll get back. Thanks, George. Thank you. Our next question is from Vishal Sridhar with National Bank. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, thanks for taking my questions. Um, just on your expectations for for the year ahead on same-source sales growth. Um, you know, the, the 5 to 6% same-source sales growth, wouldn't that functionally represent uh, inflation in the system right now? And wondering how management is thinking about real same-source sales growth. Does this outlook imply um, flat or negative real same-source same sales growth, that same sort of less inflation as we look, look into uh, uh, fiscal 24? Um. Yeah, our same store sales growth assumption are based on uh, a combination of traffic and basket and unit and price, but I think we're in an environment where uh, on a real basis, uh, we've been fortunate enough, as we talked about a bit earlier, to benefit from trade down and market share gains. So uh, 
that that would definitely be real SSS gains. Okay. Um, with respect to the quarter, obviously, um, you know, very, very strong. Um, were there any transient events that, that happened in the quarter that may have impacted demand or anything of any significance? Or was it, was it um, a, you know, I, I don't want to say business as usual, but was it lar largely um, a smooth quarter in terms of demand trends? I think business as usual is the best way to put it. Okay. Okay. Uh, that's it for me. Thanks. Thank you. Our next question is from Karen Short with Credit Swiss. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks very much. Good to talk to you again. Um, a couple questions for me on comp. Um, so if I understood correctly, it sounds like your comp in 1Q is in that kind of 14 to 15% range. So I guess is that accurate? But your full year guidance very much implies a slowdown in 2Q to 4Q on a one, two, and three year basis. So any color on that? And then can you give an update on what comp you need to leverage fixed costs given the higher wage scales and FG&A that you got it to? And then I had one other quick question. Yeah, so on, on the comp, we're, as I mentioned, we're continuing to pace at um, levels that are higher than our circle average. Um, I'm, I'm not going to comment on our expectations for Q1 SSS, but um, the, the levels that we're seeing as of now are higher than the circle averages. Um, in terms of what it means for the second half, as we mentioned, we're, we'll be comping very strong SSS levels in the second half, and therefore um, the comps will, will be more difficult in the second half of this year than they are in the first half, and that's baked in our five to six percent guidance range. Um, on the scaling for SGNA, the the magnitude of wage pressures and wage growth, uh, and when you compare that to our SSS assumptions, uh, there is already some scaling embedded into it, but um, it's it's not enough to compensate for the the wage headwind that, that we're facing in fiscal 24. Okay, that's helpful. And then um, obviously, we know you talked about inventory in detail, but how, how um, what would be the right way to think about inventory growth in 2024, 20, <clears throat> maybe on a per store basis, um, or, or just how to think about it in general now that you've kind of accelerated the receipts and you're back to a little more normalized levels? Yeah, the, the way we look at it is from a turns perspective. So we look at the inventory turns. Um, what we're seeing uh, in Q4 of fiscal 23 is inventory turns returning to pre-pandemic levels, so more normalized levels when we were um, in, the, in the midst of the supply chain crisis, uh, you saw inventory turns going up significantly. So I would... I would expect Q4 to be a decent gauge for how we think about the inventory turns going forward. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks, Karen. Thank you. Our next question is from uh, Chris Lee with Desjardins. Please go ahead. Oh, hi, good morning, everyone. Um, maybe first question, maybe for JP, um, just on the SGNA, the um, midpoint of your SGNA rate guide. Sorry, Chris, we just lost you. We'll, we'll move, Chris, we'll circle back. Yeah, we'll, we'll move to the, to the next, next uh, question. One moment, please. Perfect. Ms. Lee, uh, Mr. Lee, go, uh, please go ahead. Hello? Chris? Chris. Chris Lee from Desjardins, please go ahead. Your line is now open. Okay. Sorry, can you hear me better now? Yes. Sorry about that. No, I just wanted, wanted to ask a uh, first question. It's just on your SG&A uh, guidance. Um, the midpoint is around 14.9%, which is about sort of 14.2% pre-COVID. I guess my question is, do you think sort of this is the new level given you know, structurally higher cost pressure because of higher wages? Or do you expect the rate to improve over the longer term as you continue to, to benefit from the positive impact from scaling of the business? 
It's too early to tell. I mean, we'll see how the year evolves. Uh, there, there's a factor which is the labor market. There's another factor which is our revenue growth and the scaling. So uh, it's too early to tell if that's uh, the trend for the long term or if uh, it's a yearly thing. Okay. And and then just on free cash flow, just based on your response to George's question earlier, can we assume you know that you know free cash flow for this year should be higher than 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 last year? We don't provide guidance, as you know, Chris, on our free cash flows, but it's usually a function of our EBITDA and our capex envelope, and I commented on our working capital. So um, I think you can derive the equation. Okay, gotcha. And maybe a last sort of modeling question is maybe on depreciation and amortization. I think last year was up around 35 million year over year. Again, directionally, should we expect a similar pace of increase for this year? If we don't, again, we don't provide guidance on uh, depreciation and amortization, but keep in mind that it's function of CapEx, which is relatively in line with last year, and it's function of store growth, which is also relatively in line with last year. Okay, got it. And then maybe switching gear quickly to Dollar City, um, I think a couple of quarters ago you've mentioned that your partners did not really have an intention to exercise the put option in the near term. Just want to check in to see if that is still the case or if you can comment on, on, on that. For, for now, that is still the case. Perfect. And then maybe Neil, just wanted to ask you a question. Um, you mentioned that you're seeing some, you know, consumer response to the new higher price point has been very strong. I was wondering if you can maybe unpack that for, for us a little bit. Um, you know, you know, which where are you seeing the strength, and and what metrics are you looking at, and and maybe if you can share with us, you know, within the higher price point, are the vast majority of them being sort of new products that that you haven't sold before? Because based on our survey, I mean, obviously that's what we're seeing, but I just want to confirm. If that's the case, that these high high price points are mostly new products that are really resonating with the consumers. Thank you. So the vast majority are definitely new products, uh, as you've clearly noted, and they they range across all departments in the store. I think that the strategy we've always tried to be very conscious of, uh, in order to not overwhelm both our customer. Uh, nor our buyers with with a you know with a, a pressure to 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 specifically buy uh, certain price points for certain categories. So we try to offer a range of values across all departments, and this is simply allowing the buying group to provide even greater values at higher price points. Uh, while, while maintaining our same relative value to the market on a new range of goods. And honestly, there's, there's not any given department that, that really sticks out, so I would tell you it's quite easy. Perfect. Thanks very much, and all the best. Thank you, and you too. Thank you. Our next question is from Martin Landry with People. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. Um, I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about um, the rollout of your self-checkout terminals. Uh, wondering if you can give us an update as to where you're at right now, how many uh, locations have these uh, terminals, and uh, what have you seen in terms of customer adoption? So on, on self-checkouts, uh, we've, we've completed most of the retrofits on existing locations out of our uh, existing store base. Uh, for new stores, it's really a store-by-store -store decision. I, w I wouldn't expect self-checkout to apply to all our new stores. Uh, it's really a function of traffic and different shopping patterns that we analyze on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, so, so is it fair to say that they're in your legacy stores, uh, everywhere in your legacy stores? No. No, they're in about 20 to 25 percent of our legacy stores. Okay. And what are you seeing in terms of impact uh, uh, on your labor costs with uh, with these self self checkout terminals? It's 
it's not a it's not a labor cost um, it's not a labor cost thing it's really a customer experience element and so the focus is to given the the transaction volume traffic growth uh, that we saw pre pandemic and we're seeing now is to optimize the checkout lines and make the experience better for customers okay and um, just moving on to your new store openings, uh, you you know you keep opening stores at a fast pace, uh, you know more than one a week. Um, I was wondering, uh, where do you open your new stores? Are you going into smaller rural communities, or are you uh, are you going into new suburbs around fast growing cities? Like just a, an idea of to where are you um, putting new stores right now? Well, much like our, our, our buying, our, our sourcing of properties is, is uh, vast and varied, and uh, really it's more a question of opportunity than it is uh, strategy per se at this point. Uh, we're interested in, in you know, malls, we're interested in strip centers, we're interested in standalone buildings, we're interested in any location that we think will increase the convenience to our customer base and not cannibalize existing stores. So, so our new store uh, pipeline generally has a, a, a very mixed look with regards to the type of real estate opportunity and for the for, you know, foreseeable future that remains the case. Okay, and and my last question is on uh, Dollar City. I know you don't give guidance on Dollar City, but is there anything that um, you can mention or reiterate to help us uh, model Dollar City this year? You know, uh, in terms of cadence of earnings or any anything um, that you want to just remind us? Um, I mean, a lot of the trends we're seeing in Canada would apply to Dollar City in terms of customer shopping patterns and cadence. Um, and in terms of store base for fiscal 24, we think we'll be uh, able to open 60 to 70 net new stores uh, at our Dollar City uh, locations. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Peter Swire with BMO Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Uh, Neil, these like very high traffic trends that you're experiencing, do you, like, do you have a feel? Is it people coming back to shop more frequently, or are you attracting – do you think you're attracting new customers like immigrants, or are you going to say all of the above? Well, I, I would say that if, if immigrants are landing in Canada in Mercedes-Benz and uh, – as well as walking, then it's then it's then it's only immigrants. But otherwise, I would say it's all of the above. We uh, we really do see um, just a general trend and in, in, in interest in in checking the value that we've always offered to you know different groups of people that may not have have felt any need to shop at a Dollarama, although that breaks my heart, uh, and and so. It's it's everyone. Uh, it's general. It's a general thing across the board, and really, you know, the hopes are that they enjoy the experience, they enjoy the value of the shop and the goods they're buying, and that we keep as many as we can. Okay. Um, last question on a different topic. This um, dividend increase you had of 28% is, you know, an extraordinary increase. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, the thinking of management and the board and why you went for such a substantial increase? Yeah, we don't have a formal dividend policy, but we try, and we've done it in the past. Uh, when we have strong EPS growth, we try and maintain a payout that's generally in line with historical levels. Um, so that's that's the thinking process. We had strong EPS growth, and uh, we want to keep uh, a payout that makes sense and have a balanced capital allocation. Okay, and JP, what, how do you think about the dividend payout ratio? What's what's your target range? There's no target range. We it's a year by year decision. We don't have a formal dividend policy. Um, 
So, but we felt that this year was appropriate to maintain it in line with historical levels. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Edward Kelly with Wells Fargo. Please go ahead. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I wanted to just start on on the labor front, wage front, and really just taking a step back, you know, on a multi-year outlook. And I guess the first part of this is, as you think about the wage investment that, you know, you are now making, um, you know, how much of that is in response to sort of like turnover, applicant flow versus just market? How do you feel about where you're going and your average hourly rate? Um, and then as we look sort of beyond, you know, the current year, um, is wage inflation just going to be dictated by market or do you have a bit more company specific uh, work that you're looking to do um, as we think about, um, you know, even the out year? Yeah, so the, the, the turnover and the market question are, are related. Uh, because turnover is function of market, and we compete in a global labor market across Canada. Um, so we always strive to pay uh, competitive wages, and so uh, we adapt to the market as the market evolves. We've seen, as we mentioned, wage growth acceleration in the second half of this year, and we're adapting to that, and that's reflected in our guidance. Um, so that's really the thinking behind this. There's no uh, anything special or anything more than just the current market environment like many other retailers have discussed. And to be clear, okay. we, we realize that our, our employees uh, at store level, associates in particular, you know, it's really an entry job. There will always be turnover, and it is um, a first job for many people. Uh, so, so you know, the focus of the company is to ensure that you know the environment's safe, it's positive, that there's uh, career opportunities, and you know that that it's a great job. And even though it's not a very high-paying job. It's a job that they enjoy, you know, within the constraints of uh, the salaries that one can earn as an entry-level job. So it really is a priority for the company to ensure that regardless of pay, those employees are enjoying the experience uh, and that we're providing, a, you know, the proper environment. Okay, great. And just on the uh, the freight component, I know you've, you've talked about, you know, you've signed a new contract. How does that roll into the year? Um, is that more of a sort of Q3, Q, you know, Q4 story uh, that wraps into the out year, or you know, do you begin to see some of that immediately in Q1? Yeah, as, as we mentioned last year, um, around the same time, uh, those contracts are for the vast majority renewed at the end of Q4, and it trickles in uh, throughout Q1. Um, and, and you start seeing the impact in Q2, Q2 in the second half of the year. Great. And just one last one for you on store openings. You've been pretty steady at this 65 uh, number. Um, you know, it's interesting, right? Five years ago, that was sort of five and a half, six percent growth. Um, you know, it's now down to sort of like low four percent. Um, any thoughts on on how that opening number evolves over time? Is that just the number that you're comfortable with, or is there opportunity for that to go higher? Well, it's it's the number that allows us to, number one, achieve uh, our growth ambitions with our store target, but more importantly, it's also the number that the real estate market can achieve in our segment in Canada and we think is reasonable. So we always adjust in function of that real estate market and how it's moving. But it's been a steady pace for the past few years and a place where we feel comfortable and the market feels comfortable uh, absorbing our, our square footage demand. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Our next question is from Derek Vey with Canaccord Genuity. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, congrats on the, on the strong quarter. Just a, a question on, on the freight and logistics costs. Can you quantify... Um, 
what the what the headwind uh, from freight and logistics was during the during the quarter or during the year? No. <laughs> the <laughs> the, uh, the all that is baked in our our gross margin guidance, and so we're pleased with our gross margin being flat to up one percent, and it's all embedded in those uh, in those assumptions. Okay. Okay, thank I thought I thought I would try there. Um just on the inventory, um is is most of that inventory or the vast majority of that inventory uh that you have on the balance sheet now in the DCs or in the stores, or is there still a, a component of it that's um in transit like there was last quarter? The bulk of it's in the warehouses and uh the distrib flowing through the distribution center to the stores, but the answer is the bulk of it's in the warehouse. Okay. Okay. Thanks. And then, um, just following up on on one of the questions earlier, have you been introducing uh, any sort of different si uh, store sizes or, or formats within the the new store rollouts that you've been having, or should we still be thinking about new stores as, you know, roughly just over ten thousand square foot boxes? That's the the right the right way to look at it. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. There are no further questions registered at this time. This will conclude today's conference. Please disconnect your lines at this time, and we thank you for your participation.